Faceting is an interesting art. It's not like painting or writing where pigment and inks are added to paper to create a vision. Nope. Faceting is like carving and cabbing and many other lapidary arts. Creation through destruction. We take away parts of a gemstone and enhance what remains. Maybe refinement would be a better word. Part of that refinement involves losing rough weight. Up to 80% loss isn't unusual. But what happens to what we lost? Sapphire, topaz, amethyst, the lost part of every gemstone becomes the same thing. Swarf. That's the term for the fine residue created during the cutting process. We say cutting, but it's really a grinding. Coarse faceting laps are embedded with thousands of microscopic diamonds. The laps spin, and each diamond that comes in contact with the gemstone scrapes off just a little bit more. A water drip helps wash away the swarf and prevents airborne dust so we don't all get silicosis. The water and swarf get flung off into the splash pan where some settles and some drains into a reservoir with the water. Some people never clean their splash pans. Some people do it more than once per stone. It's all a matter of personal paranoia, I mean preference. I'm one of the filthy animals that rarely cleans my splash pan. But there comes a time when enough swarf builds up that it blocks drainage and I'm forced to take the five minutes to clean it out. I've done this twice in a year and a half and about 70 cut stones. Because I didn't clean away the swarf frequently, I suddenly found myself with a half a pint of the stuff. It looked like clay. The word clay means different things to different people, and can either refer to particle size or mineral group. If we're talking particle size, then clay is mineralogically meaningless, like sand. Clay is the smallest size fraction, encompassing anything smaller than 2 micrometers or 4 micrometers depending on your classification scheme of choice. Above that is silt up to about 20 to 40 micrometers, then we get into larger size fractions like sand and gravel and large boulders the size of small boulders. The size scheme is my preferred technically correct definition for clay because the other definition kind of becomes recursive. Clay is made of clay minerals. The clay mineral groups are kaolinite, smectite, vermiculite, illite, and the chlorites. The minerals comprising these groups break down into thin sheets and become moldable when wetted and hardened by firing. Looking closer at my clay, I can't tell if it's clay or silt, but it's definitely fine-grained. There's probably sand in there too, and cat hair. Different gemstones can make unique swarf. Lab ruby is tinged red, rutile and moissanite is thick and muddy, sphalerite is yellow. My swarf, a mixture of about 17 different mineral species, is a pleasant light gray. And having so much of it all at once got me wondering, just what could I do with it? Well, what does anyone do with clay? My mind wandered to pottery. But was what I had real clay? Could it become a ceramic? I needed to talk to an expert. Fortunately, I happen to know Sarah Burns. Sarah is an artist in Scotland who shares her journey on two YouTube channels, one focused on art and is named after her business, Sarah Burns Studio. The other, called Sarah in Scotland, focuses on her adventures in Scotland. Long ago, she earned a BFA from the College of Ceramics at Alfred University, and for an even longer time, she's been my sister. If you like art, expressive landscape painting, and traveling vicariously through Scotland, be sure to check out her channels and site after liking this video and subscribing. To make pottery from clay, because that's the main thing you use to make pottery, it's all based on how, what's what the material, what the dirt or clay is made out of, and how hot you have to fire it. So certain types of dirt or clay or rocky substance will react totally differently at different temperatures, and certain ones will actually completely change once they're fired at a certain temperature. Um, you know, it's called firing when you put it in the heat. Sometimes it will just completely explode depending what it's made out of. So yeah, there's there's definitely some nuances to it. The other thing is though, if you do make something, you have to be really careful that you don't have like air pockets inside because those will explode. So if you make something and it's like kind of solid in the center, usually there's there's bound to be an air bubble in there somewhere. And the moisture can't get out any other way except the thing explodes in the kiln. <laughs> like if you have a white clay or a gray clay or a red clay, it's usually a lot darker when it's wet. And then it sometimes like we used to use a grayish clay in school. And by the time it was ready for the bisque firing, and then especially after the bisque firing, it was like white, almost 
like a really bright off white color and then you would glaze it and that obviously changes everything if you go to a store and you look at your dinner plates there and there's a pattern on them not all of them use a painted on glaze but most of them do and so basically you can hand paint designs on your on the piece usually you dip it in one color and then you can hand paint of a different color hand paint on there and it when it when you fire it after that point it's solidified so that's like usually a non-porous surface after that point so you could drink out of it or eat out of it depending on what kind you use obviously you want to make sure it's food safe <laughs> if you're doing that yeah. um or it's just decorative and there's so many different types of glazes and colors you can you can custom mix them and just let them be all drippy and cool and you you end up the fa fascinating thing i remember is you dip it in like a bluish glaze and fire it and it would turn out to be like bright orange or something so you had to have like test swatches <laughs> we call them on the walls so you know this color in this bucket is that when it's fired maybe the stuff you have could be used to make glaze or part of the glaze at least maybe save half of it to mix with clay and half of it to mix with glaze and see what happens with glaze i guess it's more made of like uh, silica or something similar it has like a stiffening agent and some other things but it might work really well for that actually just don't know what color it would turn into <laughs> so you'd make the thing and then you would let that get leather hard and like very hard to the touch so you don't you want as little water as possible in the clay or in the stuff left over before you fire it and then you do the bisque firing which is the first firing and that usually removes all of the water or it explodes <laughs> if you have big pockets of air inside or if one area was really really thick and you fired it that might explode which is why you just want to give it a enough time to dry. It doesn't just remove the water, it solidifies it all together in a way. Like if you did just bake it, it would get drier, but it also might crumble. <laughs> I'm just, it, depending on how many pieces you have going on or whatever it is you're making. And then you can glaze it if you want and do another firing or just leave it. Um, but if it's a porous clay, you obviously <laughs> wouldn't, really be able to use it for much it would maybe just be a sculpture unless you glazed it see if you can source some clay and I mean obviously you're welcome to try your own experiments and try it in the oven or uh you do your own maybe, little you think maybe split it up between clay and glaze and try a little yeah glaze. um but again you will need some other ingredients if it's a glaze because i believe they add other like one or two other things so that one is like a stiffening agent so it stays on the pot and maybe one other thing <laughs> in there um and then of course i think depending what kind of silica they use is what is how it changes color but again that might they might add more things with my questions answered it was time to make something with not quite the half a pint I thought I had, I wasn't going to be able to make a cup or a cereal bowl. So, oh, oh wait, what's going on? Oh, what is it doing? Oh, no, this isn't acting like clay, but it is cool. If you watched my short video, you already know Swarf makes a non-Newtonian fluid like cornstarch in water. This will not make a ceramic, at least not by itself. I really should have done this test before wasting Sarah's time. Uh, with a new challenge that she couldn't diagnose from Scotland, I had to rely on other sources. Shout out in particular to Andy Ward's Ancient Pottery for a crash course in clay. Maybe, like Sarah said, it would be better in a glaze. Uh, she also suggested adding small amounts of clay until it was moldable. Now I could go out and buy clay, but why bother when I had this? I'm up on Wawawai Canyon Road and stop by at a this like kind of pillow basalt unit there's lots of veins coming up through a lot of rounded features and i think this is the base of a flow in part because at the bottom it kind of looks like there's a soil horizon and i want to collect some of this stuff which is a really bright red and see if we can i don't know maybe make some kind of pigment out of it. 
sent it to my sister at some point, maybe. At the time, I thought I would collect that to use in pigment, which is why I only have a few pieces. After processing it with a rock, I rehydrated it and mixed it up. Raw, this stuff is too gritty to make into anything. It had cohesive strength, but was too brittle to bend. So I processed it and filtered out the bigger bits, leaving a more clay-like material. Now it was super sticky and plastic, too much so to make anything. But maybe that's actually perfect. I had a too plastic clay, and a not quite clay material I think is kind of equivalent to temper. Temper is a non-plastic material added to clay that doesn't shrink during firing and helps to prevent cracking. Mix the two together and maybe it would make something usable. We'll make a few test coins and see how they turn out. I let them dry for several days before glazing some with Swarf. Those dried for another day. Ceramic art is not for the impatient. And then all I needed was a kiln. I asked two places, a local pottery studio and a glass studio, if I could use their kiln for an experimental clay. They both said no. Fortunately, Sarah and I talked about ways one can fire clay at home. All it would cost me is the price of a bag of charcoal. There are numerous YouTube videos out there on how to do this, but I'll link to the one Sarah sent me. Basically, we're doing a modern day pit fire using charcoal. This is the hottest time of the year where I live in an area prone to wildfires, so I started early in the morning. Well, early-ish. I had important stuff to do first, okay? After applying an appropriately irresponsible amount of lighter fluid, I waited not quite long enough while the charcoal ashed up before diving in. Move the charcoal aside carefully and create a happy little nest for the foil-wrapped test coins. Proper firing usually means monitoring and maintaining a specific temperature, usually above 1800 Fahrenheit. The absolute minimum you need is somewhere around 1,000 for clay to start turning into ceramic. My charcoal fire was... high. But while sitting inside in the AC waiting out the heat, I read the briquette-style charcoal might not get hot enough, maybe only reaching 700 F or so. F indeed. I immediately went and bought a bag of lump charcoal. The result wasn't a ceramic. While it was probably because of the low temperature, the clay itself also turned a gross brown, and in order to remove a variable, I got a hunk of potter's clay from a hobby store. Andy Ward used this exact clay type to fire pottery in his backyard, but right out of the box, I can't use it. It needs a temper, which again is just small particles that won't shrink in the fire. Sand makes a good temper, but I didn't want to buy any, so I grabbed some rock fill from around the fire pit, screened out the bigger chunks, and then borrowed a window screen. Don't tell Morgan. Carefully screening through that leaves dirt and debris less than about three-tenths of a millimeter smack dab in the middle of the sand size range. Just rinse off the screen and pop it back in and nobody will know what you did. Pour out quite a bit of sand, I probably didn't use enough here honestly, and knead it into the clay. It takes some work. I decided to make two variants, one with a bit of red clay and one with swarf. The ratios weren't quite 50-50 with more clay than the other add-ins. The swarf clay turned out whiter, makes sense. Since the stuff was also real sticky and annoying to work with, I wound up panicking and making a few dimpled discs out of clay just to make something. Whatever. Not like I'm going to use these for anything anyway. I still wanted to try the swarf as a glaze, but in the first firing my coating didn't look good. A good way to make your own glaze is to mix pigment with clay. I forget the ratio that you're supposed to use, but I think I did close to 50-50 and created a thin solution of that. Painting it on was easy, and I was supposed to let it dry, but I was getting impatient, and these things were pretty small, so it was time to fire up the grill. I added more wood this time, and of course still used an irresponsible amount of lighter fluid. After wrapping up the pieces in foil again, they sat on the edge of the fire to warm up, and once there was some good heat going, I knocked down the pyramid and nested the foil as best I could. This was already looking hotter than before. More wood on top. Notice there's more of an opening up top to let more air flow in. 45 minutes later, I realized I'd forgotten to put the original batch back in the fire. <laughs> I tossed them in and did my best to bury them partly without disturbing the new foil pouch. More wood, and then it cooked all day. After carefully picking through the still hot embers, here's the final results. Several the uh, small, roundish pucks. Well, yeah, as expected. They felt solid, and the refired coins felt more ceramic-y, but I suspect that's not the right clay for this, and maybe was already baked and so was already fired and wouldn't make a clay again. 
I was still able to break them, and when it was the swarf only as a glaze, it didn't really bond to the discs and flaked off. The new clay worked much better and had a more of a ceramic ping to it, though the pieces aren't large enough to get much of a ring. The swarf mixed with clay bonded much better. It's a pleasant white on the buff gray of the ceramic, but it doesn't sparkle like the gemstones it's made out of, and I think it would be indistinguishable from other white glazes. To check if they fired properly, one test is to dunk them in water. If it dissolves, then it's still a clay at heart. The little puck bubbled quite a bit when I first put it in the water, which isn't a good sign. And yeah, it's definitely not ceramic. The new clay held together, but the swarf made no difference in the clay, and as is glaze, it's kind of meh. This isn't the way to get your ceramic sparkling like a gemstone. If anyone has any suggestions for what to do with swarf, let me know in the comments. Until then, don't bother using it for this. But hey, the fire pit technique worked, so that's cool. Thanks for waiting like 20 years after I graduated college <laughs> to ask me questions about this topic. <laughs>